Good morning. If you have a New Testament handy, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to primarily camp there this morning. Let me get this thing turned on. All right, last week we covered the first 20 verses of Luke 10. And the very last of those, verse 20, Jesus says to the disciples who have returned from this limited commission with ecstasy and joy because they've been able to cast out demons. And they're so excited off the charts about that. That he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Being right with God through Jesus Christ is infinitely more important than having a euphoric experience that is so unique, so incredible, that uh, so awesome is people might say, that uh, it's unlike anything else you could possibly experience. Having your name written in God's book of life is infinitely more important than whatever that may be. Even casting out a demon, as thrilling as that might sound, having that kind of power, supernatural power at your fingertips, Having your name written in in heaven is infinitely more important. But how do you accomplish that? There are three little episodes in Luke 10 that go surprisingly well with Solomon's class this morning about discernment and coming to terms with the will of God even in difficult situations. We want to talk about the relationship between truth and light. The relationship that the truth of God revealed through Jesus Christ, through the Bible, can give us life, eternal life, through our our Savior. And in these three episodes, we'll talk about valuing the truth, applying the truth, and loving the truth. And I like to teach these to non-Christians, to unbelievers who are seeking God, men and women who are lost, who, who need Jesus Christ, and healing power of his blood. Christianity is not about finding some experiential church where the value of the experience outweighs anything else on terms that you define yourself. It's about coming to terms with Jesus' truth and submitting to it. But first of all, in order to do that, we have to value it. How much value do people in this world place on this book? How much value do people in this society place on this book? I would say that for the most part, it's largely undervalued. And people underestimate the value that they should attach to it. And so right off the bat, coming off the heels of, uh, uh, of Jesus' statement, do not rejoice that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We read in verse 21 that uh, in that same hour, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see 
and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What price would kings with their wealthy treasuries uh, have paid to be able to see and to hear what these apostles, these disciples were now experiencing through, through Jesus and his teaching? It's true that God's grace is promised to everyone. And Titus 2, verse 11 says as much, that the grace of God has now appeared to everyone. It's also true that God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. So you have in this first paragraph, verses 21 through 24, Jesus praying in the Holy Spirit to the Father and then turning his attention to the disciples and saying something to them that reflects what he's just prayed. But how is it that he prays for some to come and, and, and to see this and others to remain blind? If it's God's will for everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth and to be saved and for the grace of God to appear to everyone, why does Jesus pray here in thanks to God that he has hidden these things from some people and revealed them to others? And the truth of the matter is that that uh, not everybody is going to see what God has prepared for all of us. Not everybody is going to hear what God has prepared for us. And the gospel of Christ has a built-in decoder, humility and hunger for truth. James talks about receiving with meekness or with humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls in Luke 1 or James 1 21 in Luke 8 in the parable of the sower Jesus talks about some soil types that are more receptive to the truth of the seed which is the word of God he says than other soil types and he says in Luke 8 and verse 10, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables. So that seeing they may not see, hearing they may not understand. And there he cites Isaiah chapter 6. When God commissions Isaiah to do the prophetic work that he does in the Old Testament period, he says the same thing. That, that your, go your work is going to be frustrating because you're going to go out and, and, and speak the word of God and, and some people are not going to see it. You're going to uh, speak the word of God. Others will not be able to hear it because they're hard of heart. And uh, so Jesus says in Luke 8, 11, now the parable is this, the seed of the, is the word of God. And uh, he says in verse 12, the ones along the path are those who have heard. The devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and, uh, and, and be saved. The Word of God has a built-in decoder, and it reveals its truths to those who really want it more than anything else, and it hides those truths to those who, who really don't. There are many, many passages in the Bible that, that address this. I've listed a, a few on the chart. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is one of those. The Apostle Paul says there in verses 3 and 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So there's such a thing as, as self-inflicted blindness. And the devil capitalizes on that. Ephesians chapter 4 says in verses 18 and 19 that Gentiles are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous 
and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. Now, the devil is involved in that, and he capitalizes on it. And in a manner of speaking, they, they do it to themselves. In 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul speaks of those who do not love the truth. He says in verse 10, beginning of 2 Thessalonians 2, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's sad but true, but the gospel does not attract very many people who are proud and self-righteous. And so Jesus describes that as, as two categories of people, one that he calls wise and intelligent, and another that he calls little children. And so we can either be like little children in our reception to the Word of God who are humble, not proud and arrogant and full of, of outer facades of, of ego, or we can be like those who are wise and intelligent who uh, are, are full of pride, and the Word can't get through that barrier of hardness of heart because one is too proud to hear it. And that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul speaks of, of those who actually hear the Word of God versus those who don't. And he says in, in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it, it, it is the power of God. Down in verse 23 beginning, he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I want everybody to hear this message. I want everybody to respond to this message. But the truth of the matter is not everybody wants it. And we can't force that issue. People have to be hungry enough and humble enough to see it for what it is. And pride blinds them to that. And it, it, it creates this, this barrier that prevents them from seeing it. I would challenge every one of you, and I would challenge everyone that I studied the gospel with, to be humble enough and hungry enough and to eliminate ego enough to be able to see this message for what it is. And Psalm 19 addresses that point in verse 7, beginning, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. And again, how much do you value this? There are precious principles in here that can save our souls and to make us wise and to help us three th see through the fog of, uh, of darkness. I call the Bible God's night vision goggles. There are things that, that Jesus says to his disciples that, that kings and prophets of old wished to see and hear but could not, and now you're privileged to see and hear these things. 
do you value the opportunity that has been given to you? I'm so thankful that I was born and grew up in a time and in, in a society where Bibles were everywhere, where my parents taught me these precious words, where I've had opportunities entrusted to me to get to know this book. I'm so thankful. And we could have been born in a different time, in a different place, in a different circumstance. Do you value what you have here? How much do you value the Bible? Responding the way that we need to respond says more about our own hearts than it does about the power of the message. It says more about us than it says about God. So we first must value it, and then we must apply it. No matter how much we value it, it still has to be applied. Solomon made that point in this morning's class. So you have on the heels of this first paragraph in our lesson this morning, the next one, where a lawyer rises up and he challenges Jesus. He stood up and put him to the test, verse 25, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? So this man asks a question. He's a, a scribe or a, a rabbi, a lawyer. And uh, Jesus answered the man's question with two questions. He answered the question with a question, two questions. Essentially, what does the Bible say, and how do you interpret it? What, what, is, what does it actually say, and how do you read it? How do you interpret it? What does it mean? Those are the two most important questions. <laughs> Again, on the front end, of, of, of once you value the truth of God, what, it, what is actually there and how is it interpreted? What does it mean? And this man answers that, th those questions with a citation of, of the Old Testament, the two great uh, principles of the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being, with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And number two is love your neighbor as yourself. And um, what that means is this man already knew the answer to his question, which means that people can understand the Word of God with clear intent because Jesus said, you've answered right. Do this and you will live. Eternal life will be yours. All you need to do is to do what you already know to do. Do this and you will live. Application is possible. This is a doable proposition. God's word is not buried in an endless maze of theological mumbo jumbo. And in order to justify himself, and I read that in the sense that in order to save face, this man asks a follow up question Well, who is my neighbor? Neighborhood boundaries are not so easy to define. And uh, Luke 19, 18 had spoken about loving your neighbor as yourself. And uh, the scribes had argued endlessly about loving a neighbor who is one of the sons of your people. And you can imagine the theological questions that would have fostered how far does your neighborhood reach? Uh, would it reach Gentiles? Would it reach Samaritans? Would it reach fellow Jews like um, Zacchaeus, who were publicans? 
how far, how, how big is, is the neighborhood anyway when it comes to loving the, the sons of your people? And in this man's loophole theology, so common amongst Pharisees, especially in the first century, the, the real question we might ask is, are you looking for a way or are you looking for an excuse? And I'll tell you this, that I, I, I have a, a library full of books about the Bible. And there is a lot of material in some of those books that I cannot take too seriously because it goes to gr- th- th- these books go to great lengths to show one how to engage in loophole theology. And theologians are some of the guiltiest culprits when it puts when it comes to putting questions where God wants answers. Endless maze of questions. One question after another, after another, after another. And what this man is doing and trying to justify himself is to push back against Jesus and essentially say, well, it's it's not that easy. We've got to engage in in a a, a deep theological question about who my neighbor actually is. And and, and there are just all these theological questions of how, how far the neighborhood extends. Love your neighbor as yourself. We could, we could talk for hours about, about who's the neighbor and who's not. Jesus says, you've answered correctly, wishing to justify himself. He, we've got this follow-up question. And, and you know how Jesus deals with that, right? He tells a story to drive the point home and to decimate this man's fuzzy theology. And that story is what we call the Good Samaritan. And this is how it reads. Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem from, uh, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And I'm going to tell you something. You, you put, leave this little episode in its proper context. We, we, we go to great lengths talking about the love and the compassion and, and the mercy. And, and whenever the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is unpacked, we talked about doing unto others and all of that. And and those are all valid applications. But in the context in which Jesus uses this, he's answering a question, who is my neighbor? And he's making it obvious who the neighbor is. And he's throwing in the idea that a Samaritan could be a neighbor. And the man can't even answer at the end, uh, you know, but it, it is the Samaritan. He almost impersonalized the oh, the one who shows mercy. He knew who the neighbor was. It wasn't the priest. It wasn't the Levite. It was the Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jew. But the Samaritan was the neighbor here. Because he did what any God-honoring human being would do in this situation. The priest saw this man half dead and walk away from it. The Levite did the same thing. Who was the neighbor? The Samaritan was. We don't have to talk about the theology of how big a neighborhood is for hours and hours and hours. You already know how to make the application. You go and do likewise.
It's no accident that the major players are a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Application is possible here, and eternal life hangs in the balance. You go do what this man did. But we not only need to value the truth and to apply the truth, we, we need to love the truth. And we need to love the truth even when it bites and when it hurts. We need to be humble enough and hungry enough even when the changes that we must make are painful. Verses 38 through 42, we have a final episode in keeping with the same thread. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The story is not primarily about sibling rivalry, although that plays into it. You have two sisters, and I do know something about that. I raised two daughters, <laughs> and I kid you not. Uh, when one daughter, particularly the older one, uh, would irritate the younger one, um, the younger one would say to the parents, tell her to help me. <laughs> Almost in exactly the same language that uh, Martha uses. Tell her to help me. And uh, we would have to speak of higher principles uh, when that uh, kind of thing occurred. And this is not an indictment of a clean house or a well-prepared meal. I'm a big believer in both of those. And there, there's a place for all of that. There's such a thing as doing one's fair share of the household duties. This was a special occasion, and, uh, and, and with a lot of you women, uh, uh, every occasion is a special occasion, and you want to put out your best and 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 honor honor guests. Martha certainly wanted to do that with Jesus, and she was frustrated with Mary. And so, instead of taking her frustrations out on Mary right then and there, she takes them to Jesus. Tell her to help me. Mary was listening to the Lord teaching. Seated and mesmerized, while Martha is doing all the work, or so she thought. But the interesting thing is, the way that, that Luke words this, is that Martha was distracted with much serving. So who was the distracted one here, and who was the one focused on the important task at hand? That's the key question. Martha was the distracted one. Mary was the focused one on the infinitely more important issue. And when we ask ourselves, you know, what, uh, who decides what is on the must-do list and what constitutes a mere distraction? When Jesus helps Martha to see the bigger picture here, he says, Martha, Martha. And, and he's kind about that, but insistently kind. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Some things are infinitely more important than others. And Mary has chosen those things. And you haven't, you're not there yet. What a lesson. Truth in life. Valuing the truth, applying the truth, loving the truth. How much do we waste on distractions? when we let go of the one necessary thing? How much of your life have you wasted on distractions and forgotten about the most important thing?
And when I teach lost men and women the gospel, and we come across these three episodes, I make these points. We're dealing with information that will decide where you spend eternity. You can either be dismissive of it, or you can value it more than anything else in the world. But you'd better listen carefully. As Jesus says in that parable of the sower, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Are you subject to the invitation call of Jesus Christ? Can we help you come to terms with the gospel and respond to it as if your life depends upon it because it does? We're going to sing a song of encouragement to you right now. Let's stand and do that.